before? Yeah, we're uh, 38 this morning. Wow, 38. Of course, uh, it's, uh, oh, it's October. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Excuse yeah. me. Sorry, I live in Thailand. It's almost never <laughs> cold. There, so. I was surprised to see your, uh, your parka jacket there. Uh -huh. <laughs> 38, that is, uh, uh, blah, 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 blah. yeah, that is, uh, that's pretty cold. That'll be single digits. It, it, in, uh... It's cold, but it's refreshing. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I was last home in Scotland, I think three going on four years ago in uh, in November and, and again in December. And I remember walking around Glasgow with my boots on and my dad's parka going from office to office in the refreshing cool. It was beautiful. Hello, Jerry. Uh -huh. Hey, Craig. How are you doing? Hi, Jerry. All right. Hey, Doug. Thanks, darling. Good night. <laughs> It's my daughter dutifully handing me her tablet and going off to bed. Oh, nice. No, no, no electronics at night. That's great. No, no. For, oh, we had an issue going on a year ago, I guess. And we had a big talk about it. And since then, she's just been wonderful about it. Yeah. Wow. And she knows herself. She feels a lot better. I love so the that you have the Tao Te Ching over your shoulder there with the motorcycle in front of it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I'm still <laughs> struggling to get through uh, the age of surveillance capitalism. Mm. Oh, mm. goodness. What a heavy, heavy book. But uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe if it were written know. as a comedy. No way. <laughs> really hard to do. Really hard to do. It ain't funny. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although, you know, historically, satires and things like that have had very good yeah. effect. Yeah, it's a good approach. Yeah. You've got yeah. serious points to make. Yeah. And the I gesture, the gesture often has more liberty at court than anyone else does to say things that the king doesn't want to hear. So right, yeah. there's different ways of delivering bad news. <laughs> How is everybody? Doing okay? Good, Jerry. Despite the world melting, we're good. Um, last week, uh, I think it was Pete who, who said, hey, why don't we like pick something to focus on? So I just sent the invite out saying, hey, why don't we pick something to focus on and we'll alternate weeks. We'll do regular check-in rhythm uh, every other week. And then uh, let's try for a while uh, just to, to zone in on one topic that we care about and just stay with it for our 90 minutes and see where it takes us. I will be annotating in my brain, of course, uh, but let's see what else uh, shows up and uh, what we can do with it. So now taking the floor is open for nominations on topics. Hey, Allison. Hey, Gil. Um, the floor is open for nominations on what topic we should spend our 90 minutes on or some portion of the 90 minutes, because it could be that we spend 40 minutes on something and then we're like, I'm spent. And then we switch. doesn't have to be one thing for the whole period. Okay. You said that you had a nomination of topics. Why don't you go first? Uh, I, will just, I, will just, I will describe a question that came up yesterday which requires some expertise to answer. But the question, a friend said that this new open smart contracts environment with Ethereum, et cetera, et cetera, is like this huge open database that will solve a tremendous number of problems because you'll be able to query it for who did what to whom, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, actually, I think it's much more opaque than that. I don't think that all these transactions are naked. I don't think the smart contracts are easily queried. Uh, I know that in the blockchain, and this is where I realized how shallow my expertise was. I know that in the in the blockchain uh, stuff is encrypted, and you, you know that something happened, and that some amount of uh, of a tra transaction happened between persistent identities, but not much more is disclosed. But then, in the layers above, I actually don't know how they operate in relation to or or whatever else is going on. Anyway, I'm I'm over posing my question, but the question is um, just how exposed or naked or available are smart contracts on platforms like Ethereum? It's a, it's a geeky question, but it goes to what kind of a society are we going toward and how visible is everything going to be? So I have one question I want to insert and maybe Please. if anybody has an answer and they want to throw in a name of who might be a good person to pose that question to, it might give us a list of people that we would want to interview on Leaving the World. 
That's a very nice idea. Thank you. And and so and so even as we pose questions to maybe talk about uh, any suggestions for resources, people, other sort of stuff, drop them in the chat, uh, say them out loud, uh, anything like that. Uh, Mr. Kaminsky. Um, Jerry, I wonder if you could uh, write your question in the chat, maybe. I can do that. Um, and and I wanted to. Um, my wish from last week was not so much that we have a topic, but that we capture what we talk about and have an artifact, not just a, a converse, an ephemeral conversation. Uh, would you like to open a HackMD page so that we can join you on taking co collective notes, or are you thinking something different from that? Um, uh, how about the room? Uh, would you be interested in having a HackMD where we could take notes together? Anybody else? I, I, I'm thinking the answer is no. <laughs> or, I'm not saying jumping up and down, but. Well, the other way to do that, maybe a better question to ask, uh, could you persuade me that we should take notes on, on HackMD? Um, <laughs> we, could also take, um, we could also take notes in the chat or on the Mattermost, which then makes them messier and not, not easily editable, but it certainly gives us a record of, of what happened. I think trying to keep notes in the chat would be fine. I think uh, another another component uh, of my wish kind of is that Recording um, instead of talking and talking and talking and talking and, and drifting, um, if we talk for a little bit and then reflect on what we've talked about and try to capture that a little bit, maybe into the chat, um, I, I think that's, a, that's better than just like continually kind of cycling and drifting. That sounds great. I love that. Uh, Gil, it looks like you are being freed from the carbonite that you've been frozen in for the last millennium. <clears throat> and you're muted. And there's no telling what's going to happen. Exactly, exactly. All bets are off. You can see it's all flowing. Yeah, exactly. And if, I, Chuba yeah, if there we go. I got to orient to. If pleasure. Chewbacca is frozen next to you, I want to see him thaw too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, anyway, question, Jerry, it seems that there's two questions in there. One is fairly technical, which is about how this shit works. And the yeah. other is whether this is a good idea because it presumes that life is transactional and I'll assert that it's not or not, but there's a lot more, there's a lot more than can be rendered in a transaction description. Yes. And it, it, there's also these sort of economic, economic, socioeconomic, um, implications about, the need for government and, and central institutions. There's a whole there's a whole argument about the D web that's kind of involved in my in my question in a sense because because his assumption of, of great transparency was was a statement of great faith in the in our future because this great new distributed uh, open database was available to query like crazy. Um, Allison, would you like to talk for a second about your question and then then we'll go to Gil. You put one in the chat. Sure, I am. Um... I guess I'm just kind of wondering whether or not there's any consensus with the room. And, you know, it, it feels to me like sometimes we're talking about blockchain, and which is good. It's to solve a problem of creating that no need for fake trust because we trust in the blockchain. But I understand where your question is coming from. Do we? How do we really know what's behind? And, um, it, but it, it feels like then we're putting trust into the blockchain. So stepping back a little bit, I'm just curious about whether or not there's consensus because I kind of tend to think and maybe I feel a little bit like a zealot about it. Um, I was in a conversation the other day, actually not a conversation. I was in a room listening to Paul Hawken introduce his new book about climate change regeneration. And he's putting together a website that's the world's largest repository at this time we're aiming to be of solutions for solving climate change in one generation through regenerative solutions. And so we're looking at this from a materials and an environmental perspective. And even though Paul verbalizes, and I hear it verbalized a lot, that the economy is the central cause to climate change. It's not climate change. The economy is the central cause to inequality and the climate and the economy is the central cause to war and, and, the, climate, and the economy is the central cause to political instability and kind of all of these things. Um, so, so the uh, solutions that are proposed are to get people to call and divest their funds from banks, you know, get banks to divest their funds from fossil fuels. 
And that felt kind of like 90 solutions to me. Um, it, you know, Paul's brilliant and this whole website is brilliant and beautiful. And I hope that it attracts a lot of people, but it occurs to me that what we're failing to draw attention to or to acknowledge on a broad level is that a debt-based monetary monoculture is kind of the trim tab of trim tabs, as Gil might say, right? Within the, the middle of it that sort of spirals out and creates so much more. Now, when we can acknowledge that we, we might approach the problems differently, we might just jump into blockchain and maybe it doesn't mean anything, but just looking for some, I'm wondering what y'all see. That's Thank you. And there may be a hybrid question in here that emerges as we put our different questions in the conversation here, because uh, you know the, the nature of money, the theory of money, the use of debt, uh, the, the foundational elements of our modern economy and whether they're going to change or how, I think those are great questions as well. Um, and I think a bunch of us have scratched our heads about them. Um, and and for some of them, experts would be really helpful in the room. And for other aspects of this, ex experts would be really damaging in the room because I think that the conventional wisdom on a lot of these things is pretty broken. So experts would be good at defending conventional wisdom, but not really that open to these strange futures we might be getting into. So you, you rattled off a bunch of questions. I wonder if we want to put those in chat or, or if we want to Who's not. Doing? Well, I would, I would say that I'd keep it a yes or no question to the very initial one. It's not about much else other than is a debt-based monetary monoculture creating so much else, right? Is that, is that to blame? Yes or no? So let's um, let's put that on the table. And then, uh, Gil, you, had a, you wanted to contribute a question? A couple of things um, to the... Um... To the D, I, I, I am not at all persuaded that a D-Web solves, solves climate collapse. Uh, the voluntary transactions solve climate, climate collapse. We're at the mercy of voluntary transactions here. And um, you know, we're trying to build a global regulatory structure. But if you look at the Paris Agreement, there's you know, 100, what, 196 countries signed on to that. Uh, all but one is not meeting their goals. Only one is on target. You look at the corporate claims of net zero by whenever hardly anybody's on track. Um, you know, a lot of the loudest vo corporate voices for climate action are spending their lobbying money opposing climate investment. Um, so the world of voluntary libertarian associative, you know, um, smart contracts that are great, but does that get us to where we need to get to? And then there was something else that you said that I wanted to respond to, and I don't remember what it was. I loved, I, I loved your riff. I just got off the phone with a young woman in Sweden, in Malmo, who was reporting that her younger, she has two younger sisters. Her youngest sister is really different from the rest of them. And she is pissed. Mm -hmm. And she just turned the family, the extended family upside down by, re, by reporting recently at a, a family event that she, she decided not to have kids because the world was such a mess. And I said, is she mad like Greta Thunberg, Matt? And she said, that's a big piece of it. And, 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 and the person I was just talking to said, and, and I keep telling her that she's right. Like they've got the data, like we, I agree, but how do we move things? Yeah. So. And something like half of millennials have had it with capitalism. Yeah. And, and we're at this weird place where we don't know what the next script is. And the, a bunch of people are saying, oh, it's D-Web, it's, it's cryptocurrencies and D-Web, that's gonna solve all our problems. A few wealthy billionaires are saying, no, 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 we have to populate other rocks. That's, um, uh, yeah, there, there was a really good political cartoon. I'll, I'll share it, I'll screen share it in just a second that I saw yesterday uh, that makes a, an interesting point about that. Uh, Did you see the exchange between uh, Shatner and Bezos after the landing? Yeah, yeah. Shatner wants to talk about the profound spiritual experience of being in space and Bezos wants to spray everybody with champagne. Uh, yes, and also, and also let me see if it comes up. Come on, please open. There we go. Perfect. Let me do a quick screen share to show you the political cartoon that came by yesterday. Yeah. 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 Kind of makes this point really well. Yeah. So yeah. one of the challenges here, and Alice, this is what I wanted to say for your thing, is that um, um, 
we tend to hop on solutions in the next shiny object, but, uh, but you know, prescription without diagnosis is considered malpractice in medicine. We do a lot of prescribing, we, not, not we this group, but we humans do a lot of prescribing without a, clear, without a clear diagnosis of what's going on. And that gets messy in this realm um, because we're drawn to cause and effect and cause and effect is not very good with complex intertwingled messes. Right. So that's partly what I'm wondering. Really careful about that. Yeah, I'm wondering if this is a if this is in fact analogous to a medical situation where you could get a diagnosis properly and and work from there. And one of the things that's that's cool about OGM, one of the reasons I'm here, is that this is a group of people who tend to orient at least somewhat to complexity and multi-causality and the not and the not simplistic mechanistic approaches of the dominant culture and so that's part of our richness here to me and i want to really you know i want us to elevate that in all that we do um anyone else want to offer a question or refine the several questions that are on the table doug yeah the question that's most on my mind is how do we actually start cutting the use of fossil fuels? It seems to me that there's no cut that wouldn't immediately lead to loss of jobs uh, and homes. And so we're stuck. And so th there is no concrete proposal right now that I'm aware of as to how to start actually cutting the use of fossil fuels. Doug, why do you say there is nothing that would result in loss of jobs when we have more jobs in the renewable industry than the fossil industry in this country now? And, well, and trending. I would tend to make that a question. I mean, the issue of jobs is, is complicated, but if you cut a specific use of fossil fuels, it's going to cost new jobs, loss of jobs that are not otherwise being lost. Yeah whether it's like transportation or home heating or whatever. Well, home heating, there's a whole bunch of new jobs coming because we have to transform a building stock of tens of millions of structures. But like, isn't this, isn't this true of every technological- Yeah, innovation? but let me take exactly what you're suggesting. Yeah. That needs to be put on a timeline. Yeah. To replace yeah. home heating yeah. with from gas to electricity is a mega project in terms of time, cost, and geography. Yeah. And the California Energy Commission is grappling with it in very specific terms, just promulgated this week. I don't know if it's proposed or adopted to have to go to heat pump uh, heating and water heating systems by 2030 and all new construction and some and some pace of change for retrofit. It's a, it is a massive project, but there are organizations that are grappling with it at a policy and programmatic level. I think the numbers don't add up, but that's I make that a question. Okay. Um, so there's, I think there's a, um, a class I'll go to you in just one sec. Um, I think there's a general theme here about uh, mental models and how they've changed our behaviors and how to sort of rescue ourselves from some, from some of the really dysfunctional ones. A part of this is sort of debt slavery and uh, the monetary monoculture. It, that, that's, that's actually sort of a set of agreements and, and, uh, and assumptions uh, and also I think uh, things done by people in power in order to enforce taxes. Uh, there's a really good book, Against the Grain, by James Scott, where he talks about why were the four grains were so important to early cities, early civilization. And uh, his point is really lovely. He says they grow above ground, which means they're visible. You know when somebody planted them. They ripen and are harvested roughly at the same time. So there's a big harvest festival. They are easily transported and stored with some minimal loss, but you can kind of store grains pretty well. They're, they're good for taxes. Potatoes are shitty for taxes. They grow underground. You can kind of put them any place and you can pick them up out of the ground at any moment, right? Uh, but grains, so, so forcing people to make a lot of grain and be, create grain-based economies is really, really good for kings and churches and whoever. That, uh, I hadn't thought about that, and it's super interesting. And people so in the he's saying that he's saying that grain agriculture came about out of compulsion. Uh, yes. Wow. Yes, and that the people in the early cities who had very grain-based diets, were eating lots of bread and not a lot of variety and not that much meat, 
um, had, um, if you look at their bones, they had dietary issues that you can see from their corpses that the marsh Arabs who were living out in the, the in Mesopotamia did not have because they had really varied diets, right? Anyway, I'll put the, the title of the book here, but but there's a there's a lot of what we're talking about that's kind of about the framing of how we see society working and what the role of a thing like a currency even is and where that goes. Uh, Klaus, sorry, I, I meant to go to you. Yeah, to Doug's comment on, on jobs. Um, I mean, clearly we are in a transition period that may be comparable to the industrial transition you know, in the 19th to the 20th century, except it's on fast forward. <clears throat> when you look back, I mean, my favorite example always is New York City having over 2 million horses uh, on the streets you know, in, by 1880. And by 1920, there are pictures where you can see the same street um, full of horses and horse drawn carriages. And then by 1920, everything is uh, automobiles and, and locomotives pulling uh, trolleys. So we, we, and the disruption this caused really se severely contributed to World War I and then you know, resulting into World War II because the, I mean, the, the Habsburg Empire, for example, was being outperformed technologically by the British. You know, they couldn't compete, but yet they had all the power. So, so when, you, when you look at, at the disruptions being caused by technology, it is, it is significant. So the, here we are going in the same way, you know, getting out of fossil fuels is an enormous disruption in the economy everywhere, in agriculture, you know, in transportation, in, in power generation, and so on. And it doesn't really matter what you do with the monetary system that drives it. The monetary system, the, the changes in monetary system uh, enable us right now to decentralize the economy. I mean, we technically, we have the capacity to decentralize and create uh, regional currencies, local currencies, you know, that, that could assist in, in rebuilding the economy from ground on up. But obviously, that is changing the fortunes of very powerful and very rich people, you know, who don't really don't really uh, feel yet compelled to participate in this transition. So, so we, we are forced to force the transition, uh, which is unfortunate because in a sane world we would all understand what needs to be done, but that's not happening. And we have little unity about where that transition, in fact, ought to go, what the right moves are for that. Allison? I um, kind of feel like it's just a, a 12 angry men situation or something. And I'm, I'm determined to bring everybody over to um, acknowledgement that, that actually that, that piece of the debt-based monetary monoculture, I wasn't sure if you were on board with that, <laughs> Klaus is in fact creating what we call extractive capitalism. So, um, so to say that it's extractive capitalism and not the debt-based monetary monoculture, then what we go to is we talk about people's values and you're right, um, Pete, I think that we have this screen that becomes then our value system, but we haven't seen how much that's been incentivized and driven by by the by the monetary monoculture and when we look at blockchain as like a, a new opportunity to change our money system we're failing to perceive all of the different ways that money has been used and created throughout history and and the repercussions of that so so yeah i'm gonna still get yeah, yeah thank you pete i want to hear you pete go ahead You're muted locally. Uh, thanks, Allison. Um, uh, Allison and Stacy and I had a bit of a discussion in chat about um, uh, debt-based uh, monetary monoculture and extractive capitalism. Um, my my feeling is that um, debt-based monetary monoculture is is an enabler for extractive capitalism. Um, but I don't think that extractive capitalism is a value system that we came to. I think it's a hyperscale social structure. So starting with more or less grains and uh, agriculture and 
learning how to tax grains and use the taxes to have a state that um, gets bigger um, and gets more people sucked into um, uh, creating grain that creates a more wealth. You you start this um, you start this uh, vicious circle of uh, something that's bigger than uh, a small tribe of people or an extended family. You end up with a social structure that competes with other social structures that are getting big at the same time, and you you um, you get winners out of that. So it keeps bootstrapping and nobody likes the fact that agriculture, um, uh, grain-based agriculture made you more sick and less healthy, um, but you were coerced into uh, participating in that social structure and, and economy. Um, you're starting to see money in there and stuff like that, but you're coerced into um, participating in this social structure that's not necessarily good for you, but it's good for the social structure that's getting bigger. That social structure competes with other social structures. They get better and better and better. You um, you end up uh, evolving into feudalism. You end up uh, evolving into multinational corporations. Uh, you end up evolving into the extractive capitalism that we've got now. So nobody like said, "Oh my God, uh, extractive capitalism is my value. I want to." Um, extract as most the most value I can, um, unless they're driven by the thought that if I die with the most money, I win. Um, if I accumulate the most money, I have the most power. I can influence the most politicians to make rules in my favor. I win. So capitalism is kind of like a mind virus that um, preys on. Um, weak humans that want to get bigger and more powerful um, and it creates a social structure with a lot of mass a huge amount of mass an unimaginable amount of mass something like amazon or google or facebook has got more mass than you can imagine um, and these big social structures rampage around and do stuff so i think um, debt obviously helped you know, helped finance corporations in the 1400s or the 1500s or whatever. Um, uh, uh, the uh, financial markets, the way that we've said, well, I'll tell you what, um, uh, I'm a capitalist and why don't we make this rule that, that the way to, um, uh, the way to account for my power um, is is with dollars. Um, I think that's a, I think, you know, since I have billions of dollars, I think this is a really good way to keep score and a really good way to make decisions. How about if I, I make, uh, I help make rules that make that more important. Money gets more and more important. And then we start inventing like financial derivatives and all that kind of stuff. And we think that's important. Um, all of that is, you know, it's, it's around that debt and around money. Um, in that situation, I think a monoculture of money you want, uh, it's, it's kind of like a fractal echo of the fact that capitalism got big. Um, capitalism likes monocultures. Um, it makes sense that you would end up with a monoculture of money, but that's not the cause of it. The cause of it is the structural thing that let human minds form a, a social structure and then for those social structures to compete with each other. Um, so that, that we based think monetary monoculture. <laughs> I didn't hear anything else. And I, and I so like great. That. We agree. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's important though. It's important to notice. And I, sorry, Jerry. <laughs> um, actually, I was going to ask you if you want to jump in because you raised your hand and put it down. Um, Just that I think it's really interesting and I'd love to look at the book, but this grain piece is really great that you drew attention to it, both of you. And I think it's crux, right? Um, and, and that, yeah, like the system started to be built upon that in a militarized and in, 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 in one control kind of a way. So how do you pay for a military to protect your grain, right? You yep. make an official currency and, but the, the issue beyond that actually is just one way of doing it. It's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is having a potluck. That's another way of doing it. So the, then, the grain is inherently going to deteriorate, but the money does not. And that's another part of it. So maybe I should add to it instead of debt-based monetary and monoculture, 
a refusing to die Voldemort debt-based monetary monoculture. So that's inherent in it too, because, because the grain will decompose eventually, right? So you need to be able to share the wealth. And that's a, a gift society, other than protect it, hoard it, use it as a way to accumulate. But the money system that you put behind that is what enables the military, it's what enables hoarding, it was incentivizes hoarding, and then it incentivizes this vying for power, it incentivizes extraction, and incentivizes the extraction. So we have this, this, this broad op values, we, humans are complex, we have all these wonderful things that we're capable and horrific things that we're capable of. And what we're capable of, just like a genetic disposition, or, you know, talking about what Gil was referring to on um, looking at this as a medical condition, right? We might be genetically disposed to have some heart disease, but that's gonna depend upon the environment. It's not just automatically gonna have heart disease, right? So it's what genes come alive within the environment that we have. So what human characteristics come alive within the environment that we have. And I don't think that a large part of climate action or political action is recognizing that the human characteristics of greed and of power and of playing just to win are caused largely because of this cesspool of Voldemort debt-based monetary monoculture that we swim in. And so when we try to replicate another system because we don't trust the government, we, we design these technical systems to do the same thing. And until we get to the position where we recognize the effect that it's having us and what other options and opportunities there are to make money that is, that is benign, look at the wampum, right? Really important to look at what money can be in its most beneficial way of truly creating trust. And at this point in time, I think it's worth, worth talking about. Thanks, Allison. A uh, couple of things. Um, first, it feels like we've sort of landed on our question. Uh, so that's good. Um, second, I wanted to slow the conversation down a little bit and just offer up the bits of evidence that I've collected around this and talk about the book Against the Grain a little bit and then talk about a couple other things. And I've, I've created a thought for this call, uh, which is this thought right here. And I've connected it to monetary monetary culture, which I have not connected up to other kinds of things. <clears throat> and I was also going to connect it up to one of my favorite books that many of you have heard me talk about really often, which is Polanyi's book, uh, The Great Transformation, which I'll, I'll bring in in just a second. <clears throat> but Against the Grain is lovely because um, James Scott, uh, who's writing I really, really like. He also wrote three, Two Cheers for Anarchism. Uh, he wrote, uh, da -da -da, here we go, uh, Two Cheers for Anarchism, The Moral Economy of the Peasant. And the first time I ever heard about him was Domination in the Arts of Resistance, Hidden Transcripts, where he talks about how people who are being suppressed, usually peasants, how they fight back. And the one example that stuck in my head was the king is parading down the aisle and one of the peasants farts really loudly. And a fart is a form of silent protest where you can't actually tell who farted, um, but it's a, it's a way of you know, sending a fence back to, the, back to the king. Sorry, I meant to continue sharing my screen. Um, so anyway, let me go back to Against the Grain, which I, I do recommend. And what, what Scott did was he said, look, this has been really bugging me for a long time. So I, so I vetted this thesis with all kinds of people who go deeper than I do into the anthropology, into the history, into everything else. And they checked off on this. So, so in some sense, in the intro to this book, he says, uh, you know, I doubted myself, but I, I went and, and had this vetted by a lot of people. And he talks it, uh, and so this point about cereal grains make it easy to tax people. Uh, only grains are visible, divisible, accessible, storable, transportable, and rationable. Um, taxable cereals also require a ton of labor, labor, which drove slavery, which drove war. And then, Allison, you were talking about how then you need an army to protect it, et cetera, et cetera, because now you have a standing asset. Uh, farmers do a tremendous amount of work to grow grain, to protect it against pests, to do all these other kinds of things. And it all, all factors into the, the formula. Um, so there's, there's a particular kind of society. Uh, then separate from this in Algonquin, I think, or Haudenosaunee nations that were mostly matrilineal, the, 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 the way of allocating um, uh, food and other sorts of resources was 
all surplus was put in a couple long houses and the elder women of the tribe allocated it back out to whatever family needed it. And it was all considered sort of communal property. And whoever brought more stuff in uh, went and, and took it there. Uh, and then, um, and then the Great Transformation for a second uh, says something that, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. sorry, my brain is, my little fan is turned on, everything is overheating. Uh, so here's the Great Transformation, which I will connect to today's call as well. Um, and I've got a five minute university on the Great Transformation, which I'll post in the chat. <clears throat> but basically what Polanyi says is uh, what I've got actually uh, sort of uh, written over here a bit that capitalism is like a cuckoo bird <clears throat> and cuckoos are brood parasites. Cuckoos don't raise their young. Uh, cuckoos raise, uh, lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And the first instinct of a cuckoo chick is to shove everything else out of the nest. And so capitalism, um, one of the premises of Polanyi in the Great Transformation is that he says market market economy requires market society. That's one of his more famous quotes, that in the double movement. But what he means, I think, is that capitalism can't happily coexist with people doing the matrilineal thing with longhouses and living happily on land they don't own and separate. And capitalism absolutely has to have um, land you can buy, labor you can hire, uh, money you can, you can sort of buy anything with, and everything needs to have a price for capitalism to be happy. So I think one of our questions here is sort of existential about capitalism, uh, because what is the causal relationship? Is it capitalism that drove greed or greed that created capitalism? Is, what is instrumental to what? What is causal to what? I don't know, and I'm not a philosopher, and that's sort of beyond my pay grade. And I'm, I'm interested, but it's way beyond my pay grade. <clears throat> but we're living inside of a series of systems which ran rampant um, and ate our world uh, and, and ate most of the world. Like, like it's surprising how far and how deep uh, this, this system of allocating and living has gone. And, and when I see the SDGs, the United Nations Well-Intentions uh, Sustainable Development Goals, uh, one of them is like a minimum wage. I'm like, God damn it. Why, why do we care that anybody must have $20 a day in order to get food and shelter, why don't we say, hey, it would be great if, if a bunch of people on earth were now living really well without having any wage, but they had shelter and, and resources and knew what to do. I'd, I'd be like happy if we were actually moving into a world where that were happening. Um, and, and I think a future like that is dramatically difficult for anybody to envision. So in the middle, we get these weird conversations about um, universal basic income or you know, how do we sort of share the wealth. Uh, the moment you try to tax the rich, I love that AOC wore uh, a white uh, big coat that said tax the rich to the, uh, to the awards that were held recently, you know, the Met Gala. She had a, a you know, in, in red, in blood red on the back of her coat, it said tax the rich. I'm like, woo, okay, make a statement. Um, but the moment you say that, the, the far right and all the people who have wealth and who have assets basically scream bloody murder and say, you're not, you know, you're taking my wealth over my cold dead hands. Um, it didn't say eat the rich, which I think is a, is a good thing. I think it had it said that it would have been even more controversial, but maybe more fun. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop there, but I'm, I'm, I'm offering in uh, lots of different threads that I've found over time are really interesting and important for me in figuring out um, how broken capitalism is, how it broke society, how it broke us, whether it's fixable. So one of the big questions out here is, can capitalism be fixed or do we need to actually replace it wholesale? And if capitalism is a cuckoo bird and a brood parasite, then chances are it's going to be really hard to fix it because it doesn't like to coexist with any other system. But I could be wrong about that. Um, Gil? Uh, you're muted. You're, you're, you're hard act to follow today. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, did, um, did grains enable armies or did armies enable grains? Um, so very few places had a standing army way back when. Yeah, like well, standing me, armies were new. Well, let me say it a different way. Did, yeah. Did, did big, strong guys with a bunch of, uh, you know, friends who were thugs enable grain? You know, if, if, if grain, somebody said before the grain, had, grain agriculture had to be compelled, and this takes me back to Andrew Schmuckler's amazing book, um, The Parable of Tribes, and people are familiar with it. 
but it basically asserts that if you, you know, if you imagine a, a, an island with 10 tribes on it and nine of them are like the Hadnasi and one of them is like is a bunch of thugs, it's very hard to see it to, to, to see a scenario where the thugs don't dominate eventually. So that's the so, background problem here. If this is if we're in a system that is that is a system of compulsion, how do you beat that without you know without an arms race? That's a fundamentally right. difficult question. To the um, um, uh, I'll, let me let me just leave it at that for now. There's many threads that you've spun here. Um, I, oh yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Could I, Pete, if I could, sorry, if I could just finish the thought. Um, if if capitalism as we know it now is an emergent system, emergent over you know, both the last few hundred years and the last few thousand years, it's not like somebody sat down in Babylon in you know, 2700 BCE and said, let's invent something. These things kind of emerge. So and now are deeply, richly intertangled in many ways. Um, you know, the question is, is, how do you unravel it? How do you design something different? How do you design a transition? Um, you know, um, what's his name, Ben, um, Ben Hunt at Epsilon Theory, which is a very interesting site, if people aren't familiar with it, periodically set, has a hashtag BITFD, burn it the fuck down. But, you know, that could get very random. Uh, the history of revolutions is pretty problematic. And so, you know, back to Doug's point of what's the plan? It's not just a plan for decarbonizing the economy. How do you decapitalize the economy? There's not going to be a single plan to do that. And a, a lot of heads are cracking against that wall right now. And, and in the meantime, there's a whole tribe that's saying the answer here is Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, decentralization, the D-Web, blah, 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 um, which really complicates things and may or may not be the answer, don't know. Sorry, Pete, go ahead. Um, Gil, I liked your, your parables of, parable of the tribes thing. And what's, you know, how do you counter one one bad egg, one bunch of strong men. Um, I think there's a bit of a, um, I want to say false dichotomy in there. I think um, uh, one of one of my observations about the society that we live in, uh, the society we live in, I, I, I feel like it's the evolutionary winner of a couple thousand years of arm races, right? And, um, and we've, we are blessed with being the survivors of a, a bunch of nastiness that wiped out any humans that weren't um, weren't able to be enslaved or feudalized or whatever. Um, one of the artifacts of that is we have a really hard time thinking about society other than um, a strongman society, extractive societies, and things like that. So. It's I, I I felt tricked by that question. You know, okay, you put ten tribes on a, on an island, and one of them is nasty, and so the nasty tribe is going to infiltrate and take over everybody. That's the story of our history, um, and we can only see whether we like it or not. I do not like this history. I do not like subjugation. I do not like slavery. I do not like feudalism, um, and yet I. I'm not even forced to live in that society. It's just an outcome of, of the history that, you know, um, my ancestors were either subjugate, subjugated or the subjugators. Um, and anybody who disagreed with that philosophy or, you know, some kind of cool matrilineal um, society that actually, you know, um, uh, solved problems with, um, with peace rather than war, we wiped all those people out. We literally killed them all. So I think, you know, I, th I so I go back to that question. You know, I, th I think it's an unfair question. That's not the way the world really would have worked um, if you put a thousand humans on on a, an island in ten tribes or something like that. I I'm not even sure that you know, you would end up with a bunch of assholes in one tribe. Um, and I'm not sure that the other nine tribes wouldn't like push them off the, you know, off the island into the ocean and 
and let them stew for a while and then come back and and be nice people again i kind of think that ten thousand years ago twenty thousand years ago the rootstock of humanity was a bunch of diverse people um and it it would it didn't have to turn into a, a combat winner takes all thing i think we could have come out with different um different equilibria e equal equilibrium um uh uh, things. It's just that we didn't. And now I find it really hard to in, in, even think about any other solution to that, right? It's like, well, of course, you know, assholes take over the world. I'm not sure that's true. And, and, and yet I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm not, I don't know how to figure out a way to think, you know, from my ancestors from 10,000 years ago, instead of, you know, where we ended up now. A couple of brief things, and then I'll pass it to you, Julian. Um, this is why I don't like Lord of the Flies or Ayn Rand and objectivism and things like that. And when people quote what John Galt would do as if like a normal human ought to do that, who is morally good, I'm like, Jesus Christ. But all of that points up to one of the stories that is sort of sitting in the background for me here, which is that we're in a constant fight over the narratives in our heads, right? And the narratives in our heads are what Pete just said, ate our brains, which is like, there's, there's always a dominant ruler or what Gil put in, in, you know, in the conversation that, that this always devolves because the strong man wins or whatever else it might be. And some of this is, is sort of uh, the, the conclusions from evidence overlooking at history. Some of this is just bad stories that we shouldn't let infect our brains because there's better stories hiding right behind them that we need to get back to in some way. Um, and then, uh, Gil, what I said about how Holland skipped feudalism, it, this is a tiny side note, but it's actually really interesting. There's a book titled Amsterdam um, that's about the history of Holland and the Dutch. And it turns out, um, hold on one second. Uh, I need to sh shift places for a second, but oops. Uh, I'll keep going. So there's this book, Amsterdam, which um, is basically says that the Dutch wound up having wealthy merchants. They, um, they invented, the, they invented uh, a kind of boat called the Herring Bus, B-U-S-S, -S, I think. Got this all in my brain. And one of, the, one of the ways that Holland got wealthy was they invented a way to fillet herring on board ship early. Uh, and then they were doing a particular kind of filling that left the spleen and the liver in the herring whose enzymes made their herring sweeter. So Holland herring was a luxury good during that era. Everybody would wanted some. And that made, their, that, that made a series of wealthy merchants in Holland who didn't need land. There wasn't land. You were busy reclaiming land from the ocean. So the whole culture of polders and everybody has to work together to drain water to make land for the country. That makes for a different spirit. Anyway, there's a bunch of things that are about Holland that are different. And note that Holland is the place where the first stock exchange happens. And by the way, the etymology of stocks is stock from German Dutch. A stock is a stick, a piece of wood. And the original ones, you in inscribe the, 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 the trade or the debt on the stock and you broke it in half and you gave a half to each party. Um, so that was a stock uh, back in the day. But, but there's lots of sort of exceptions to the rule as we go and we forget them. And, and I'll, I'll add something where I'm just repeating something that I think Pete said earlier, which is we get, humans are so adaptable that we get very used to the current circumstances and we, 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 we adopt current assumptions and we forget how things happened before. Um, Julian. Uh, with respect to Lord of the Flies, I was gonna bring up that <clears throat> it's a uh, total fiction as opposed to what came out a couple of years ago was a real life Lord of the Flies and the, the complete opposite happened. So um, it is possible to create societies like that. Uh, the other thing is I don't understand Doug's comments. It looked kind of like iPad of the Flies. Is, it, is that what you meant? Uh, say it again. Your, your comment, it's, it looks like I, a semicolon pad of the Flies. Oh, uh, I'll have to change that. Thanks, Julian. Klaus? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to come back to the this power equation that's inherent. You know, we started out with looking at, at currency. The, the, we are going through a complexification of the economy that makes it impossible you know, for a, a single entity to rule a complex economy as it has evolved. And I think the Trump administration was sort of 
um, a last kick up, hopefully last kick up of trying to have um, a top down governance you know, of the economy, uh, realizing that it's just not possible uh, any longer. So the, 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 this, this mandated diversification of the economy driven by you know, the, the complexity of our technology, of our society in general, um, uh, demands, a, a, demands a decentralization of power. So there has to be a new, a new form of governance that, that by force is decentralized and, and, and spread out. And that uh, is the fight we are currently seeing. So, so the, 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 that's really what is, what is playing out, you know, where, you, where elements of uh, central control and most of that linked up to the fossil fuel uh, industry is hanging on to, to, uh, to their control over the economy, over society versus uh, this being broken apart by innovations and and uh, and new ways of doing things, the food business is you know, a perfect example of that. So I, I think much of the turmoil that we have right now is driven by the technology and by by the complexification of society. Not so much because uh, uh, any uh, the, the people in governance have a great interest in decentralizing power. Um, let me slow things down also a different way by going back to Allison and saying, are we near your original question? Can we route our way back toward it? I'm wondering. I, I don't know. I kind of want to keep it really as simple as possible. And well, your first question wasn't that simple because like the original phrase, and I've forgotten now beyond Voldemort, but it, it involved a series of different sort of, sort of actions. You, you weren't asking only about uh, monetary monoculture, which would have been like the simplest maybe question in the middle of it. There were like layers to it already. Yeah, 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 thank you. So it's, I think that there's, there's a few things that are in threes. Um, the monetary design, I kind of see it as three aspects to that design that are problematic. One is that it doesn't die, that it doesn't deteriorate or decay and ultimately go away. Um, and so when it's being put into savings, it needs to grow metastasize, compound interest, in order to grow its value against the decline value of the unit itself, right? So it needs to have um, exponential interest attached to it through compound interest growth. The next thing is that it's loaned into existence so that there's basically never as much money that is being circulated as there is that is owed, right? So. I owe, when I pay back my loan, I owe my principal plus the interest of it. And nothing's wrong with loans, but it's the way money is issued. So we're always robbing from Peter to pay Paul, putting us in, in, in competition with one another and the money siphons upward and outward of the system. Um, and the third thing is that it's a monoculture. And so we're completely dependent on this and we're not we're having other options. We're starting to create these options with blockchain now, but they're not at all. You know, We've created them throughout time through complementary currency. So I see it as those three things. And I know that one in the group is interested in salutogenesis and that everybody's heard of salutogenesis, right? No? Salutogenesis is um, health promotion. It was kind of the beginning of the positive psychology movement back in the 70s by Anton or Aaron Antonovsky, which states that there are basically three things that people need to be well, and that's um, a sense of meaning, that, that, that life has meaning, that life is manageable, and that life is somewhat predictable. And we can look at that and see that the economy in some ways is, is how, does, how does money is salutogenic or not? And what we have with money is, you know, what meaning does it have? What is the meaning of the transaction or the relationship that's being created? Two, that life is manageable. So do we have enough money to meet our needs as a medium, a medium of exchange? Right. And three is, do we have a store of value? So is there a sense of security in the future? And so with the monetary design, we are trying to meet those needs with one design so that the medium of exchange is actually something that operates against a store of value and vice versa. A store of 
storing our money is antithet is antithetical to using it as a medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. Using the same money for those two purposes, those two fundamental human basic needs of meeting, you know, and making life manageable and, and predictable is they're operating against each other at odds with one another. Have you heard of demurrage currencies? I heard of demurrage, yeah, that was yeah. the Excel's thing. And that actually worked really well in a way that if we look at where it was used and started in the city of Wargle, have we talked about this yet? You guys are familiar? No, you should, um, <clears throat> will you tell the story? The miracle of Wargel was right there at the in Austria. It's, a, it's a, an Austrian town after the the Treaty of Versailles was written. That that's after World War One, saying that um, that Germany was going to need to pay back all of their debts in Austria too eventually. So because of the those debts were absolutely insurmountable actually to be able to pay back amidst those economies. The response of the governments, right, were to create money underground in order to fuel a new military, and that was all happening underground. Right. Um, but um, and and Hitler was rising to power as a way to say, "Hey, we we're going to live well again someday." But there was a mayor, Uten Guggenberg. <laughs> he was a small town mayor, and he'd read Sylvia Gazelle's work about how to create money that deteriorates over time so it incentivizes people to use it and that's the process of demurrage so he created the money he spent it into existence instead of lending it into existence so that's not a debt-based money he gave it to people so it's called freigeld or free money mm -hmm. and it was in exchange for services so there's a church that was deteriorating and so people didn't have any work. He said, here's the money, take the money that we are printing and in exchange for fixing up the church. And then the, <clears throat> the bar would accept the money and you know the, lo the local markets. Would, and so it was circulating, it created circulation because the only thing that was missing was a medium of exchange. Everybody had, the food was there, but it was about doing the work and um, making things happen and having faith that we could trust one another. Anyway, by the end of the time that they were using this money, they repaired a bridge and built a ski jump. It wasn't just meeting needs. They went beyond that and built a ski jump as the most beautiful metaphor, in my opinion, for how, how good can it get? And hundreds of mayors actually came to learn from Mayor Uten Guggenberger about how he did that, how he created prosperity and peace in his village. And as soon as this event was going to happen where he was going to teach other mayors how to do it, there was a legal um, mandate by the central bank that said, no, we are the only people who are allowed to create money. You can't create money. So it didn't have anything to do with what good was being caused in the village or what was working, nobody was, it was just who had the power to create the money. And we've continued to do that kind of thing throughout history. And we went into World War II. What would have happened if all of these mayors had done, what a thought experiment would be if that idea had spread at that time and continued to spread? Where would it we? Feel, it mm -hmm. feels to me like Ursula Le Guin has written some books that are, are, are like alternate histories of what you're describing that I should have read, but haven't read, and I don't know where to start. But I think she was experimenting exactly with these kinds of ideas um, in a really lovely way. Um, and I just lost my thread. I was gonna add something else to what you were just saying. Um, Jubilee I had in there, and uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of remarkable how much commercial activity runs against what the Bible says, for example, like, like, I don't know, it seems like religious capitalists choose their biblical phrases really carefully. Um, uh, Gil, you're except you're munching, you're still in the middle of munching. And hi, Jane, it's really like really lovely to see Jane, you. Jane wants to speak. Let me just add something. The, Wonderful. The Bible lends itself to selective reading very well. Um, but on this subject, it repeats itself many times. The whole, the whole business of the Shemitah year, of the every seven years when land is fallowed and debts are remitted and slaves are freed is, 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 um, is set forward at least three times. 
in different parts of the Torah. I mean, which is, you know, which, which our learning from that is that this is really important. It's not something that's re repeated a bunch of times. It's really important. It's not just a casual thing to interpret however you want. So there's that. And I put some stuff in the chat about that. It's a very, <clears throat> a very rich and extremely radical component of that lineage that for obvious reasons is selectively, selectively read out. Of most of the readings, because it's just too hard for people to grasp. Jane wanted to add something. Here she is. Please. Oh, good morning. <laughs> um, well, um, there's an idea that's been having me for many years, <laughs> having its way with me. And um, that idea is that it's possible to align uh, human financial bioregional economic credit with the drive to enhance ecosystems rather than degrade them. And that this is a source of value in bioregions. And this is the source of value of money of the demurrage kind. Um, and that if you do good to your bioregional ecosystem services, it goes into a bioregional bank and is credited. The value is credited. And as values accrue, ecosystem diversity goes up and all kinds of measures of ecosystem health go into the positive zone. And human beings, farmers, people, citizens can um, create those stores of value in a bioregional currency. And that currency can be issued as credit. Um, and bioregions then become the source of the codification of wealth, real wealth in America. And that eventually, because bioregions uh, span state regions and Gil, could you stop the rustling please? Um, states, Gil, could you please stop the rustling? Thank you. Um, The scale of, of currency matters gets confused in people's minds between state and local governments and the federal fiat system, which is the issuer of currency. But bioregional currencies could become issuers of bioregional currencies. There's nothing in the state laws that prevents states from developing complementary currencies currently. And I could foresee a situation where the bioregions accrue their ecosystem values, their, their accrual of soil. You could literally create soil um, and create credit at the same time that eventually the states, the bioregions would become the source of extending real credit to the United States federal government in a system of real wealth that is the original in God we trust. And that the um, um, the politics of the United States would shift around this issue of bioregional self-reliance and trade and human forces would be driven to enhance ecosystems and not degrade them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, government budget crises that are constantly happening because mm -hmm. state budgets have to figure out how to tax in order to have revenue. Mm -hmm. That problem will begin to be solved. Mm -hmm. And we would free, we would have a freer thinking in our population that would allow the federal fiat system to do best what it does. So we would have a storage currency in the bioregion and a flow currency in the federal system. 
and it would work. I'm not sure how, but Allison probably knows. <laughs> I have the same vision and people are working on things like this and envisioning it. And I think I agree with you. I love your vision. And I think multiple flows, different flows in the ecosystem that are both bioregional and that can be but that actually, because they can communicate with each other, like a Bancor, you know, a, a national and universal kind of a thing, yeah. like they can communicate. So, it, so for when hence it, it emerges, that's kind of like this sense of ultimate empowerment, right? The virus is that we're dependent and the value of our work is dependent on working hard enough to prove ourselves worthy to get access to this currency that somebody else has. And, that freedom of the mind to say that what we can do is create our own, right? Which is kind of what's happening, but with what intention? What's behind it? What's the meaning that we're setting forth in that contractual relationship or, you know, in that promise, that IOU? And even an expression of need is creating wealth. Whereas right now in this system, it's, it's shamed. There's a, there's a soil, there's a climate scientist in the soil He's a soil scientist and a climate scientist named Walter Yenny, J-E-H-N-E. -E. He's Australian. And he has the notion of soil sovereignty, the creation of, of um, grow bags that are these um, uh, bags made out of that felt material from recycled bottles, that um, a, a wicking bag that you would give a child on their birthday. And the wicking bag consists of a bag of soil, of a degraded soil and a tube in it that you use to put your garbage in for earthworms. And as the earthworms create a beautiful soil, you plant your vegetables and food you need to live on. You plant your vegetables in the grove and it's above ground. It can be moved, it can be owned by a child or a family and as a child has birthday after birthday, by the time they're 15, they have enough bags of soil to really support their life with vegetables and produce. And he, he uses the term soil sovereignty because you can take it with you. It's not owned by the property owner. And there's a, a, a tube system in the bottom that can uh, retain water so that the plants are, are self-watered. And... Um, his notion is that we need to have sovereignty with respect to soil and growing food for urban peoples. And um, the big fights of the future are going to, of the very near future, are going to be over shade and buildings and density and access to sunshine. Um, I wanted to add a couple things in to build on this. And first, I want to ask um, Jane and Allison if you have any resources, articles, uh, other sorts of things you can share with us that we can add sort of to for the rest of us to go get familiar with a lot of these things. I'd love that. Okay. Um, second, John Wesley Powell famously sent a, a, a suggestion to Congress saying, hey, as we expand westward, it would be great if you made the state boundaries the watershed boundaries. Yes. Which would create these natural sort of governance regions, which I thought, I, I love the idea. Third, uh, the U.S. Civil War is when Salmon Chase, the Secretary of the Treasury, invented the U.S. dollar to finance the Civil War, before which there were multiple banks issuing regional currencies all across the U.S. And if you happen to travel across the U.S., you needed to exchange currency as if you were going from country to country in the world. Um, and, so, and so they illegalized on purpose um, all local currencies. There was one fiat monoculture currency, and that's part of the, a little piece of the history of, of currency in the U.S. It also seems to me like we're playing a lot here with the meaning of the word wealth. Um, and I love the spelling W-E-L-L-T-H. That makes me really, really happy, like shifting from wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H, to something you have to hoard and preserve, to actually creating shared wealth. Uh, and then I put FALC, which is fully automated luxury communism, which is another vision of what we might be heading toward. Like if automation actually solves the problem of generating food and all that kind of stuff. And if we get rid of most jobs through automation, we're gonna need some other system. And FALC is what, one of the proposals for, for doing that. And then finally, I wrote Gandhi weaving his own cloth because 
one of the reasons Gandhi wore dhoti and wove his own cloth and had a spinning wheel was that before the arrival of the British Raj, India made the most beautiful fabrics in the world and was completely self-sufficient for food and, clo and, and cloth uh, all around. And the Raj basically made looms illegal. They transformed India into one big cotton plantation to ship the cotton on ships to British factories in Manchester and other places, the newly formed Industrial Revolution. And then they shipped those finely manufactured cloths back to India for people to buy who didn't have any money to buy them with. And then, right. and then ironically, you go to a place like Nigeria, where there's an entire culture of really beautiful fabrics that come from Holland. Like, like, like there was this, this dependency created. I think it's Holland, but, but like, like local cultures in many cases appropriated these, these manufactured goods and baked them back into the culture in some weird ways. But uh, there's all these kinds of things happening in the world. This is a very interesting perspective on capitalism as a wealth creator versus something else. Possessing earthworms could become illegal. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I, I will be one of the first to join the earthworm police. Because they're uh, automated creators of wealth. By the way, there were no earthworms in North or South America before Columbus. This is one of the things that Charles Mann says in 1491, the history of the Americas bef uh, before Columbus. And, it, and, earth, and earthworms do something to the understory that makes, the, makes soil different and makes forests different. So in the ballast of some of the early ships, earthworms show up, they propagate across the US and change the very nature of our forests. Yeah, Africa's fabric is Dutch. Thank you. That's I think that's the article I was thinking about, Pete. Um, okay, let's take a deep breath. We're we're 20 minutes from the end of our call. I think this is a bunch of good stuff. I'd love to just, as Pete suggested earlier, think about our process and and are we going too fast, too slow, too what? Um, is this like Goldilocks zone? Uh, Thoughts, thoughts on thoughts on the process and where we are, just meta about the call. Yes, earthworms are the dolphins of soil. I like that. It's Jainism. Um, this is an unusual kind of call that can't be planned for. So if you want to set up a rhythm of calls, something like this is going to just spontaneously show up every now and then, where we're just where we're riffing fast and richly. And I like it, and it makes it challenging to harvest, but it's good shit. Um, and I don't know, I mean, this is coming up sort of feel spontaneously because we're going into it in this way, but I think we could have chosen, we could have chosen the topic before the call and ended up with some paraphrase of what Allison put in front of us and, and had a similar conversation with a sequence of calls that have a theme. I think that that might still work. I'm not sure that we would lose uh, the energy we had here by being more orderly about it, but we might, it's a, it's a, it's a pop. But I, I, for one, adore wading into topics that are big like this and then sharing what we know and trying to figure out pieces of the puzzle. Pete? Um, I wonder, will we, re we remember what we talked about today in a month? So um, I'm taking notes in my brain. I will remember it because I'm connecting all these things up and I'll post that openly to, and three people in the world will, will go find that. Um, this is a Thursday call, so we will have a transcript. Right now, we're doing nothing with those transcripts. And Pete, if we succeed in funding you to create uh, Project Krav, uh, then the transcript will automatically be woven into a better place, woven back into the video, maybe at some level, but will be more usable by anybody who wants to go back in. And you and Bentley already have filters for the Zoom chat so that we can harvest all the links that we're sharing in the Zoom chat at this point. So that's done, but it's not linked prettily back into the big fungus. Um, but all those things need to be pushed harder and done better. So we're, we're on track for, for having the machines remember it. Um, I wonder if as a group we'll remember it. Um, as a group, will we, will we refer back to this conversation? Question. So I have some things at the end of this call that I know I need to get smarter about and go research. Part of the reason I'm asking Jane and Allison for resources on, on that. Um, everybody else, what do you think, Klaus? Yeah, I posted uh, this letter to a Hindu that was written by Tolstoy uh, about a hundred years ago. And it is such 
foundational wisdom. I mean, it really moved me. You know, it's really worthwhile reading so because these are eternal insights and that have been reflected in the most modern way by Yuval Harari, right? Because Yuval Harari documented the uh, uh, human journey um, from you know, Stone Age to modern uh, economy. And he's now trying to look forward and see where do these trends that are currently apparent uh, are going to lead us. And his conclusion basically is survival is optional, right? And it was his most profound recent statement. But there's nothing new. I mean, you, you go into, into Bible, right? King Solomon, but there is nothing new under the sun. Everything that you see has been already, and it will be, it will be forgotten by generations yet to come. So we're going through this cycle of learning over and over and over, and uh, nothing much comes out of it. It's like a temporary, look at the French Revolution, you know, it resets uh, uh, the, the power dynamics only to revert right back into what it used to be with a, new, with a new face on it. So right now, I think we are in an era where that can't happen again because it's absolutely going to kill us, right? <laughs> it's going to be, we are at an end phase here where whatever transition we decide on right now will determine our survival as a species. Uh, and, and that sounds like, um, so over the top when you say it, but when you look at the trends and when you look at where we're heading, I mean, that is clearly the, the only uh, outcome that you can think of. You know, we are in survival mode and 99% and of the population hasn't, hasn't accepted that yet or doesn't even begin to understand it. So, the, the, so, so we, we know everything, right? Karl Marx, uh, lined out the, uh, the uh, uh, fallacies of human nature impacting the economic system and predicted uh, quite accurately where capitalism would end up invariably, not because of the economy, uh, of the economic principles embedded here, but because of human nature. Uh, the value of values, the, 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 the values of the system, yeah, the, the system's value structure drives the, the entire political and economic process. So that's, that's, I think, where we basically are. And it doesn't matter what currency we are using. What matters is how we're using these currencies to, to generate change. Yeah. That's the, right there, the crux of something that uh, Klaus just said. That if we're going to address Pete's question is what do we propagate widely and share? What do we come from our learning today? That I, if we say that it doesn't matter the design of our currency, it's what we do with it. That is a critical, from my opinion, um, from my perspective, it's a critical flaw in the way that we perceive currencies and human behavior. That, the, that there is a genetic coding in the currency that incentivizes human behavior in a direction or another. And if we're not recognizing how we are motivated or moved by that currency and how that's influencing our behavior, <coughs> we, haven't, we haven't been able to put our finger on the pulse of what's making us sick and a society level and be able to change it. Um, I want to pause for a second and go back to the meta question about our process because we dug right back into the content. We, we like took a, took a little U-turn straight back into the issues. Um, anybody else? Uh, Stacey. So to the shared memory part, um, I think it would be really useful to look at the chat and see what three questions might be next steps. And I think one way to do it is to see where there's at least three people honing in on one point. So for example, Pete put in a, a comment, I, can't, I might be paraphrasing, but it was something like, so we need to poke holes in the existing socio-legal structure, something like that. And Klaus then jumped in and said, what better place to start than the food system? So to me, that's one conversation. Maybe we could come up with two more. So at least we leave here with some connecting of the dots. Does that make sense? I'm looking at all your faces and I'm not reading that you get what I'm talking about <laughs> or that it even is I valuable. 
I think you're trying to find focal points where we, several of us are curious about something or want to push harder on a question. And then you make those, the carry those forward in our next conversations to make them the focal point of our, of our ongoing discussions, something like that. So even <clears throat> the process of taking five minutes together as a group to see what those three things might be, might add to the, might add to the shared memory, the same way for you, when you put things in your brain, that helps you remember. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Pete? I, I love it, Stacy. Thank you. Um, I, there's a, a practical thing where I can't remember all the things we talked about. Um, I feel like we talked about 10, you know, really juicy topics. And in the last five minutes, I don't think I'll do a good job of kind of trying to figure out, you know, what the what the next conversation might be about. Um, so, so then the, the question of what to do with that is um, we, we take the, the knowledge asset that we've been building for, um, for 100 minutes, 80 minutes, um, and, um, uh, and process it later another time. Um, but that will be hard because we'll want to talk about new stuff rather than talking about old dead stuff from a week ago or two weeks ago. Um, the other, the the other thing is, even though I, I I love Jerry that we we did talk more slowly about fewer things this call. Um, the I think the way I would do it, and I'm not saying that everybody should do it or that we should do it this way, but the the, the way that makes sense to me is to go even slower than we did today um and you know as we come around to kind of one question really dig into it and start to write down more and start to uh start to listen actively listen to each other more um so as uh, allison says something or as klaus says something or as doug says something more of us could be saying, I think what Doug said was, and this is what I took away from it. And if we, if we go deep on something instead of kind of a little bit deep and then go to the next thing, I think my, my goal would be to have um, an understanding like all of us could have ended up in this talk at this time, um, having you know the two or three next things in mind instead of, I think, I think for me, what happened is we went through enough stuff that I have no idea what we talked about anymore. I kind of have some some things. I kind of have my pets. Um, I kind of have some a, a couple like sound bites from people that said really smart things, and I'm going to have to go back to the video and find them. But I don't have anything cohesive. I still don't have that. So I think I I think the answer from my 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 engineering expertise would be to slow down even more and to make that in the moment rather than trying to catch up with ourselves in another week or another month or whatever. Um, and I, I think we did go really quickly and I think I'm partly guilty for that because I want to overshare all the different pieces of evidence that sort of build the case or that argue part of this. Um, totally agree. And then Klaus, I went back to your post about Tolstoy and Gandhi and I kind of want to go deeper on that. But first let's go to Gil and Doug. So um, thank you, Pete. I hear this as an invitation to breathe uh, and maybe establish a different kind of rhythm in, this, in these conversations where there's a pause after everyone speaks rather than us jumping in as I tend to do. I'm one of those who does that. I think of Quaker meeting uh, where there's a lot of silence and a lot of reflection and meaningful speech. And that would mean a much lower volume of words in this conversation, but very different vibe. Uh, all of which begs the question for me, Pete, as I was listening to you, like uh, my teacher Bob Dunham would often say, well, you know, for the sake of what? Bob would say there's always a for the sake of what behind every conversation, like, you know, or, or you know, in regular English, what are we here for? Why are we doing these calls? What are we trying to get? What are we trying to be or do or produce? Uh, and implicit, Pete, in what you were saying is some assumption about that. Uh, and it might be useful either now or perhaps in another call to talk about what's OGM for. Because whether we follow your recommendations, Pete, or some other, it is, it's in some way an answer to that question, right? 
And, you know, maybe that was clear a long time ago. It hasn't been clear since the time I've been here, except to be a bunch of really interesting and wonderful people talking about interesting and wonderful stuff, which is great if that's what it is. But your suggestion is pointing to something else. Thanks, Kim. Doug? Well, uh, kind of a meta comment. Uh, I think that we are putting out tsunamis of words and crushing the very thought that we start our little speeches with. Uh, I used to run a group in Palo Alto called Serious Conversations. And the one piece of coaching that I did was to say, look, the reason to talk is not to uh, convince other people that you're right, but to stimulate their imagination. And as soon as you see that you've done that, guess what? It's time to shut up or you're continually talking will spoil the very thing that you just created. So hard. And when we meet face-to-face -face at retreats and things like that, I use silence strategically here and there, but not a lot, but it helps. And I find I use it way less in Zoom. So it's really strange. We just sort of keep, keep going at it. So. I need to learn some different pacing and uh, to slow things down a bit. Um, or try it out, what it's like. I mean, there's sometimes where there's a real enthusiasm and people want to jump on top of each other and maybe that's fine. But maybe you could set a kind of a different base rhythm. I know. And, and part of this back is- Back to periodically. We do 90 minute calls, which are relatively long calls in the world where people mm -hmm. have very short time frames and short attention spans. And not that I'm worried about who's listening to these calls, but really I'm worried about our own dedication of our time to this process. Because if we did, if we had had this conversation as Quaker meeting, it would be Sunday right now. And we would still be waiting for the next message to show up because we said that many things. Like, like in Quaker meeting, you wait a few minutes before between messages and you, you process things, it's lovely. How, how long is meeting for worship on a Sunday? One hour. So, you know. Do it, do it just for the hour. I know, and then I feel like, then I feel like I'll miss everything else that's in everybody's heads that's germane here. And a part of me feels like maybe there's a pacing which is, hey, let's throw ingredients in the stone soup and stir the pot really hard and hot. Then let's stop and breathe and step away from it. Then let's step, step back into the same topic and slow it down. I'm trying to architect a piece of this into weaving the world by saying we're going to have shadow episodes, post-processing episodes, feed the fungus episodes. I'm not exactly sure yet what to call them, but where we don't try to bring new material in, we go back and look at what was said on the original episode or call, and then weave it, connect it, enrich it, do other kinds of things to it. And this is this call is a great lesson in maybe what not to do or, or how, what to consider in trying to figure out how to do that. You know, sometimes soup is better the next day. Exactly. Yeah had a chance to sit for a while. And, and I, I'm sorry to tell you, but you will never get everything that's in all of our heads. So oh, I, I want to extract it now. I want, want the, the, I want the Vulcan mind melt. Surrender, Jerry. I want the Vulcan mind melt. You will, you will surrender now. Uh, sorry, Stacy, then Julian, and then me. I don't know if this would work, but I'm just throwing out the idea of maybe after a half an hour, take a total five minute break, like a commercial, where people could write in whatever thoughts they have in the chat. Then we come back, reread those thoughts and move on from there. I like the suggestion. We can try, we can test that out. Um, Julian? Uh, <clears throat> I was wondering on this topic of uh, going through old things and bringing them back out, who is gonna do that? I mean, like who to the point of names? And then the second is how are they going to make what they find available and we'll go through the curation process and make the result of that curation. How are they going to make it available to the group? So. Um, first, I think the first answer to that is whoever is passionate about it, whatever corner of what we talked about will be personally motivated to go do some piece of this. So the who I think is just self-informed, but we don't have an appointed editor. We don't have a budget for somebody to post process. And I've seen some really, really skillful people who could do that, but that's a rare skill that to, to do a really good job actually of summarizing these things. The second is we are in the infancy of the means for sharing these ideas well. Uh, when, I, when I say the big fungus, I'm, I'm envisioning, I, ha I have my own little ideas of what that thing looks like, but boy, it needs to work for people who represent things in different ways. It needs to be accessible, findable, usable, a bunch of stuff that we don't know yet. So I think that there's a lot of experimentation we can engage in 
um, to figure those kinds of things out. Um, yeah, I would actually disagree that we're in the infancy because over in the KM world, this has been a hot topic for quite a, a couple of decades, really. Uh, trouble it really it boils down to money again is getting these tools and being to, you know, to be able to wield them. Sort of, but my I've been watching CAM for three decades and it's been mostly fruitless because they have the wrong mental approach toward most of it. Like, like I, I haven't seen that many useful CAM systems. Maybe I just haven't been around. That's where the symbiosis would be better than going at it from a, a new start. So. Yeah, well, we clearly want to absorb lessons learned and all of that. Um, and then um, just for one, just for one second, just maybe to start a later conversation, I'm reposting what Klaus, one of Klaus's posts earlier, uh, the letter from Tolstoy uh, to Gandhi, and I and I only skimmed this in the in the in the chat as we were going because we were going so quickly, and we were having a parallel conversation in the chat with lots of interesting things that I missed. I'm seeing and in, in, as I scan back up to find this one, and Klaus, I think what Tolstoy is saying to Gandhi is that whatever society you look at, always everybody winds up bowing to a ruler. And I actually disagree with this. Uh, and I, I'm an amateur, I'm not an anthropologist, but I actually actively disagree with this. And I think there were many successful societies where leadership was transitional, transitory. Uh, in matrilineal societies, you'll find very different kinds of organizations. There's, if, you, if you scroll back far enough and sort of in, investigate the wisdom that survived from those places, there were lots of other ways to be alive in a group. And I don't think that human groups devolve to always having an authoritative or authoritarian leader. Um, and it's that's- worth, It's worth my reading the entire letter really. Um, the, the vast majority, there are exceptions, but the vast majority of, of uh, uh, human uh, civilized, I mean, 10,000 years ago, human civilization uh, have been uh, following um, this authoritarian bent. Um, now, in 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 the uh, tribal uh, uh, eras before that, um, the leadership was based on meritocracy. I mean, there was you know the, the strongest, the most powerful hunter, and so on and so on. But when you just just read through the letter, I mean, you, you look at sometimes uh, it was the oldest person. Uh, not yeah. the strongest. It was the the wiser. I mean, there, I think there were lots of arrangements and, and that's, that's like, that's like way, 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 way back there. And uh, you know, let's face it, uh, we are today where we are, looking around the world. You don't see a whole lot of meritocracy in, in any civilization that's alive today and functioning. So Tolstoy is is really laying out, you know, the root causes of of how we came about this. And uh, Yuval Harari is basically also uh, uh, laying it out in greater detail. This is, to me, uh, the, the culmination of the era of enlightenment. What Tolstoy writes there is what the, what the leading thinkers during the era of enlightenment had come to conclude. And, uh, and, and it's really hard to argue with. Uh, and, and, and because when you look at Karl Marx, I mean, as, as bedeviled as he is, I mean, he was just totally correct in his predictions to where capitalism would end up in the way that it is, that it was conceived at the time, that it would result in a, an accumulation of capital, not because that's inherently embedded in capitalism, but human nature would use it for that purpose, right? So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can. There, there are exceptions to the rule. What we want to do today is look at the exceptions to the rule and see if we can recreate something like this, right? But it's not there today. It, I mean, and nowhere in the world that I can see does it function. And we are at the end of our call time, and you just opened four interesting conversations in, in what you just said. Um, um, so I, I just want to open the floor to whoever would like to offer a wrapping comment to this call and then we'll process everything we just figured out and see if we can't experiment more with uh, our group process. Allison? Thank you for <laughs> entertaining the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you for putting it on the table and uh, arguing it and helping us understand it. And I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in taking it apart more and seeing what's there. And we have, we have the OGM community has a bunch of people who are like deeply experienced in lots of parts of these issues. So we can, we can sort of tap more broadly and invite people in and things like that. So any other thoughts? I really love this call. 
I thought this this call felt different than some of the others. Not that I don't like the others, but there was something special about this one. <laughs> Thanks, Stacy. I, I loved it too. I thought I'm in a good place. Thank you all. Yeah. Until soon. Now we'll play our closing theme music. <laughs> Thank you.